Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. All right. Well, howdy. howdy. It's good to see you guys. Um, awesome to be here with you. If you have a Bible, we are in Acts chapter 8. And um, I'm not going to read it all to you now, but if you want to have it in front of you as we move through the text, you'll kind of get a sense of where we're going, Acts chapter 8. If you don't own a Bible, there's some people walking around with some that would love to hand you one if you'd like one, uh, or if you just want to use it today, however you want to do it. But uh, Acts chapter 8 is where we'll be, so grab one of those. Uh, Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump in together. Lord, I just want to, I know Ken just prayed, but I just want to say thank you for Ken, and thank you for this church and uh, all the good it's done in the lives of of so many people I know personally and care about. And I just thank you, God, that that there are lights all over the city, bold lights, and it's not just the staffs of churches, it's, it's the community, it's your people, God, rallying together and saying, man, Christmas is when we celebrate that in the midst of deep darkness, a light has come. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be with us and give us life. And then now that we know him, we get to be the city on a hill. We get to be the lights of Jesus into a dark city. So I pray, Father, that the light of Faith Bridge would shine brighter and brighter in the days to come, that the world would see the beauty of Jesus radiated through the lives of this community. And so to that end, God, use today to help us not get a motivational speech, but help us see you, God, and see ourselves. And I do pray that December would look different for us as a result of these few minutes. And I want to invite you guys, uh, if you're willing, to just to, to pray. And you ask him. Say, God, please teach me today. And then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Lord, we love you. Thank you for this moment. Uh, We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7th of 1941, a scrawny shipyard worker named Desmond Dawes was among the many young men in America who took it personal and wanted to do something about it. But his only problem was he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he had sworn to never take a human life. So he enlisted as a medic. And he vowed to never take up a weapon whatsoever, not even a combat knife. And yet as his battalion entered the Pacific Theater, they were charged with a nearly impossible task of scaling a 400-foot cliff wall on the island of Okinawa and to take the summit from embedded Japanese troops. And so these men did it. They scaled a 400-foot cliff, and when they arrived at the top, they met stiff resistance, a firefight that ensued for days And then after about five days, they received heavy shelling from mortar fire, artillery fire, machine gun fire, and then a final major assault from Japanese forces that wounded over 75 U.S. troops and then drove the rest off the summit all the way back down the cliff. So that by the end of that day, the only soldiers left on top of that mountain were the wounded U.S. soldiers, Japanese forces, and little Desmond Dawes. And so that evening, as U.S. troops kind of regrouped at the base of the mountain, suddenly as one of them looked up, they saw over the edge of the cliff a body of a wounded soldier appear and then begin to be lowered down the cliff by rope to safety. And they realized Desmond was up there working. And through the rest of that night, little Desmond Dawes would run into the face of fire tend to wounded men, pick them up and carry them and lower them to safety. And by the time that evening was through, the U.S. Army estimates that little Desmond Dawes had saved 75 men. And so he received the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest award for bravery. And when they awarded Desmond Dawes with that, they asked him, what was going through your mind as over and over again you charged into enemy fire, risking your life to pull these men to safety and lower them? What was going through your mind as you kept doing that all night long? And little Desmond said, what was going through my mind was I just kept asking the Lord. I would say, please, Lord, let me save one more. Please, Lord, let me save one more. Now you go, why am I telling you that story? For this reason. 
We love those kind of stories, right? We make movies about those kind of stories, right? We'll go see those. We'll give Academy Awards to those kind of stories. Why? Because there's something about that that grips us. A little ordinary everyday guy being put in extraordinary circumstances and doing extraordinary things. We love those stories. We tell each other those stories. Why? Because they inspire our story. That maybe God will use our little ordinary life to do something extraordinary. It gives us hope, right? And you go, well, why are we talking about this now? Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died and rose from the dead while he was ascending into heaven, told his followers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then in Acts 1 through 7, you see, as the people of Jesus begin to speak the good news of Jesus, you see a mighty movement break out in the city of Jerusalem. And you see it begin to influence the Jewish community in the surrounding region. And yet in Acts chapter 8, when we enter into the chapter we're in this morning, we're going to watch the good news of Jesus jump the ethnic banks of the Jewish community and spread out to Samaria in the north and to the ends of the earth to the south. God's message will cover the earth and God will accomplish this great work through one man, a guy named Phil. And you say, who is Phil? Like, I know Jesus. I've heard of Peter, James, John. There's an apostle Paul in there somewhere. Who the heck is Phil? Well, come on, man, you know Phil. Phil was in charge of bread distribution to the widows in Acts chapter six. Actually, he wasn't technically in charge of it. Stephen was in charge of it. But when Stephen got killed, Phil was going to take over, but then he had to run because of persecution. So Phil didn't actually get to lead the bread distribution. He was the number two guy on the bread distribution team. And yet, when persecution breaks out, what we're about to see in this passage is that the last 50% of the Great Commission, when Jesus said, the news about my kingdom will go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, those last two are about to get inaugurated by Phil. God's going to kickstart Acts 1-8 through the assistant to the manager of bread distribution. <laughs> the bread truck guy is about to change the world. And he's a model to us about how God wants to use everyday people to do extraordinary things to get the message of Jesus out. Now, some of you may say this and go, Ben, um, hello, it's Christmas. Why are you talking about Phil? Shouldn't we be talking about Jesus? Like, why are you doing this? Well, as I was preparing for this, I just kept reading through all the Christmas accounts of all the angels. Angelos means messenger. All the messengers that were being sent. And we love these stories. A messenger comes to Mary and gives her good news. A messenger comes to Joseph and warns him. A messenger comes to the shepherds and tells them, there's your king. We love these stories about the glory of God bursting forth through Christmas. Send a star to tell kings that your king is here. Send the angels to tell the shepherds they're welcome too. And yet after Jesus' life, the sent ones are not primarily angels, they're us. Jesus said, as God sent me, so I'm sending you. So he sent angels to kickstart this thing, but getting the message of Jesus out is a task given to us. And there's no better time to engage in that role than right now when the world tends to focus on the life of our king. And yet the funniest thing is we celebrate when other people are doing it. Let the heavens tell of the glory of God, yes. Let the angels proclaim his birth. Yes. Now you take Jesus' name to the world. No, I don't think so. No, Ben, they will make fun of me at my office. I will not do that. I don't want to do that. And so when we talk about a message like this, God wants to take ordinary people to do extraordinary things, to talk about the glory of Jesus to the world. For many of us, we go, Ben, no, thank you. That scares me. And let me just tell you something. As an introvert, I get that. I get it. Like for me, when I waited tables in college, uh, I used to have to pray uh, just to be calm and to have courage to step out and take the order of people at their tables. And you'd say, Ben, that doesn't make any sense. That's the job of a waiter. Like everyone's expecting you to initiate that conversation. And I would say, I know. But it freaked me out anyway. So you can imagine how stressed I was when I was for years worked with a ministry that would do street evangelism. They would just walk up to people's front doors and be like, Hey, you know where you're going when you die? It was stressful for me. 
So I get it, a message like this scares me too. And yet it doesn't change these realities. One, all of us long deep in our hearts to make a difference. Number two, the message of Jesus is the most important of all messages on the planet. And number three, God has ordained that now after Christ has come, that the message of his kingdom, this extraordinary work is gonna happen, not through the angels, but through everyday people. God wants to use us as the messengers of Christmas. So we gotta get our heads around how exactly we're gonna do that. And yet before we talk about the practice of how Phil did it, because we're gonna see Phil lead a revival, we need to talk about perspective. Because here's the thing, I could spend the next couple minutes giving you technique and how to tell people about Jesus, but if you don't wanna do it, you're not gonna do it. So why give you technique if you're not gonna? So we gotta get the perspective before we get the practice. Now let me say this briefly too. Some of you may be sitting here and go, if this message is about proclaiming Jesus to the world, then I don't even know if I buy this whole thing. Like my neighbor talked me into coming. My family kind of tricked me to be here. Like, I'm not, I'm not that bought in. Well, let me just tell you something. If you're not into spreading the message of Jesus, you just came with someone. Well, just listen. Just hang with us. Because I promise you, what I'm going to give you in the next few minutes is the reason why your neighbor kept haranguing you to come to church. All right? So this is just some insight for you. That's what this is, right? And yet we look at Phil's life, and Phil's going to have this great ministry to Samaria, but before the ministry starts, we get his perspective in verse 4 of Acts chapter 8. He's part of a mass of people that launch out from Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 4, it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And you go, who are those who were scattered? Why were they scattered? Well, Jesus ended his ministry in Jerusalem, rode in, was murdered in Jerusalem, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and really all of Jesus' followers were in Jerusalem. And so a movement broke out in Jerusalem. Peter began to preach about Jesus. Thousands came to believe in Jesus. And as that movement began to grow in Jerusalem, the leadership of that city became nervous and they told him, stop talking about Jesus. And they didn't. And they warned Peter, no more speaking of this Jesus. You're upsetting people. Peter kept doing it. They began to beat followers of Jesus' movement. And then Stephen stood up and preached about their resistance to the Holy Spirit as God is doing something new in the world. And they killed Stephen for it. And as they saw Stephen peacefully accept his death for the glory of his king, they realized the only way to stop this movement is through extermination. And a man named Saul began to go door to door, dragging Christians out, taking them to prison and voting for their murder. So a massive persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. So these people do the most logical thing in that moment. They break out. And it says they scattered. But then they do something you don't expect. It says, now those who scattered went about preaching the word. What? Shouldn't it say, and those who scattered laid low, blended in, right, with the surroundings, okay, disappeared amongst the people. Why would they continue doing the activity that was getting them killed? Why would they do that? If preaching was getting you murdered, why would you keep preaching at that kind of risk? What's the matter with these people? Well, here's their perspective. They saw themselves as ambassadors of the king. And you see it in the verbs. Acts chapter eight, verse four says, they went about preaching the word. That word preaching is eulangidzo. It's to declare the good news of the arrival of the king. That's what a messenger would do. When a king was born, he would announce to every village the good news, the eulangidzo. The king has arrived and it changes everything. And then it says in verse five, and Philip, who was part of this group, went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. That verb proclaimed is the word caruso. It means to herald like a town crier to stand in the middle of the town and say, hear ye, hear ye, and give people announcements of what's happening. It was the herald of the news of the king. That a herald was someone who would ride out before the king. If a king was coming to your region, the herald would ride out ahead of time and say, your king says this. Your king is doing this. Your king is coming. A herald worked with the king, rode with the king, knew the king, and came with the authority and the announcement of the king. Right? And so your identity determines your activity. And if these people just saw themselves as regular, ordinary people just trying to make their way in the world today, then when their people started getting killed, the most natural thing to do would be to hide out, lie low, don't say a word. But if you see yourself as I am an ambassador of the king, then it makes zero sense to hide out, lie low, and not speak of him. If my identity is to announce his name, then wherever I go, 
I'm his, and wherever I go, I speak. Hiding out's not in our job description. And you saw that with these people. When they scattered, they proclaimed the word. Why would they do that? What was their perspective? Well, there's a confidence when you know you work for the king. There's a confidence when you know I work for the king and I'm under his authority and my king runs this place. There's a confidence that comes from that. That all circumstances are ruled by my guy. You see it in Romans where it tells us we know that God works all things for the good of those he loves, for those called according to his purposes. That we say, I know God works everything in the universe according to my good when I'm called according to his purposes. And these people knew that. Because it's interesting, when God, Jesus spoke to his people, he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. And it says, when they scattered, they left Jerusalem, went through Judea, and they scattered to Samaria and the ends of the earth. They saw that persecution, the worst thing in their life, was accomplishing the purposes God had ordained in Acts chapter one. So they saw God even redeems the hard things in my life for his message, that I have a call from my king that will be accomplished even in pain. Pain propels his message. That my king rules all things. And we see this in the world. When governments tried to squash Christianity in China and Iran, what happened? The church has never been larger in both of those places. That God uses even persecution to propel his message. And some of you know that. The most deep conversations about God, eternity, what we're here for, have happened around a hospital bed for you. Some of you, it's when God's afflicted you that it's freed you up from the trivial and had you begin to have conversations about what really matters. And here these people have a perspective. I have a confidence. My king runs this place, so I'm gonna be about his work because he works all things according to the good of his people who are called according to his purpose, and that's who I am. There's also not just a confidence when you know I work for the king. There's a clarity in saying, and I carry his name. That's who I am. So when I walk into a room, I don't have to wonder why I'm there. I already know why I'm there. I talk to young people who say that all the time. I don't know why I'm living in this city. I don't know why I'm working at this job. Well, if you're in Christ, you know why. You may not know some of the mechanics, but you know if I am his, I am his ambassador. And so I walk into this room to carry his name. That's who I am. That's why Philip didn't walk into Samaria and go, what am I doing in Samaria? I don't know any Samaritans. It's so weird. He walked in and said, what am I doing in Samaria? Oh yeah, I'm an ambassador. Hey guys. And he started telling him about Christ. Why? Because that's who he is. And there's such a wonderful clarity that comes to life when you realize I belong to the king. It's interesting for me. I remember when I was in college and this really landed on me, I would um, go to the lunchroom for lunch every day in the uh, Memorial Student Center at Texas A&M, and I would do what every student did. The way that lunchroom is laid out, uh, there's really only like one main door in, and you would walk in, and for a moment you were kind of on display in front of everybody, and uh, so you knew everyone's looking at me, and then you would scan the room to find your friends, and you would move to them as quickly as possible. So you knew when you're walking in, two things were about to happen. I'm gonna be assessed by everyone. I'm gonna go find my community. And so you wanted to look as good as possible when you walked through the door, and you wanted to quickly find your tribe so you could hide out. So that was kind of the move. You would walk in and be like, and two, and walk. All right, and then you would go and find your friends, right? That was the move. And so every day I would do it. Until one day, I remember I was on my way to the lunchroom and I was walking past the flag room where people sit and study and there was a guy playing the piano. And I'm not really even into piano music. Like I don't have a bunch of piano CDs or on my phone or anything. But whatever this guy was doing on that piano was unbelievable. And so literally I'm walking to lunch and I'm like, what is happening over here? And I just kind of walked in and was listening to him and instantly felt self-conscious. Because I'm like, what am I just like sitting at his piano? Be like, you just play really pretty, sir. I'm like, this feels all wrong. So uh, I was like, I'll just uh, read, I guess, next to him. And so I sat down. I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. And I realized I don't want to study. So let me just read my Bible. And there in the middle of the day, I just stopped and had this like five minutes of just sitting with the Lord, reading his word, praying, listening to this beautiful music, thinking about God, praying to God. And then I was like, okay, that, that feels about right. Put my Bible away, stood up, walked out, and I walked into the lunchroom. And when I turned that corner, it was like I had a new set of eyes. Suddenly I could see the room and I'm like, there's my buddies sitting in the corner where they always sit and who I go hang out with every single day. But it was like suddenly when I scanned the room, I saw all these people who were sitting alone that I'd never even noticed before. 
And as I walked in the room, I wasn't thinking about what people think of me. I started thinking about those people and going, who knows them? How have I never saw them? Maybe God has something for me here in this lunchroom. And I remember I saw someone by themselves and did something I never do. Said, hey, man, can I just sit with you, talk with you? What's going on? What's your story? And they were having a really tough time. And I got to touch eternity at lunch as I got to encourage them in the midst of a difficult situation. Why? Because I had a clarity of knowing when I walk into that lunchroom, it's not to carry my name, it's to carry his. And when I realize I'm an ambassador of this king, it gives me a confidence. My king runs this place and I'm his and I'm a carrier of his name. There's a clarity to that. Whatever office building or school or whatever social situation you walk into, you go, I walk in as a carrier of his name. That's why I'm here. And then there's a compassion in these people because they know this message is being carried to people who need it. So in verse 5, it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. And that sounds like such a normal sentence until you understand what this meant socially. That for the Samaritans, they were people who were hated by the Jews. And the animosity between Jews and Samaritans lived for about a thousand years. That when the Jewish people in large part were carried off into exile, the Samaritans stayed intermingled. Man began to build an alternate temple, a different religious expression. And so when the Jews came back from exile, there was animosity between them. They saw them as traitors and half-breeds. So much so that when you read about the life of Jesus, do you remember when he stopped by the well and saw the Samaritan woman and said, hey, can I get a drink of water? Do you remember her response? She never tells him yes or no. Read the story again. You never actually know if she gives him a drink of water. You don't know if he had to circle back later and was like, hey, seriously, I'm actually very thirsty. Can I have a drink of water? She doesn't even answer that question. Why? Because the implications of him talking to her were so loud That when Jesus said, can I have a drink of water? Her response was, what are you doing talking to me? Your people don't talk to my people. Your people don't initiate with people like me. What are you doing? And he blew her doors off just by the fact that he would engage with her. And yet he saw her as someone in need of the grace of God. And so he's coming for you. And Philip is just like his king. He arrives in Samaria, and he doesn't see, well, they would have voted for a different political party. They would have come from a little different background. I don't get those people. They don't live in my neighborhood. He saw people who had a need, and it stirred his heart with compassion, just like his king's. I have confidence in knowing I work for the king. Man, I have a clarity on who I am. I'm a carrier of his name. And then I have compassion for these people. I see them as worthy recipients of the message. Do you see your world that way? I did not always. I think I've told this story in here before, but I remember for me when this dawned on me was in high school. That for me in high school, there was a guy that um, was a a massive mountain of a man. And I just remember uh, he was so angry and he would wear like all black with like studs and spikes on him, you know? And uh, he was the only guy I had ever seen um, actually pick up someone and throw them in a trash can before. Like, you know, you see those in like movies about high school in the 80s or something, but this guy would just walk through the school with just this angry clip. And I remember there was this freshman kid in his way and he literally just went, Aah! we were like, oh my God, that was so violent. Like, why would you do that, right? He's just this angry dude. So I did what everybody did with him, avoided him and, you know, like made fun of him just in secret. Just like, what a weirdo, you know, like that kind of thing. And then I remember once there was a Christian concert that came in town, and so I did what all my Christian friends did. We told our Christian friends about a Christian concert. We'd go hear some Christian music and just have a good old Christian time, right? And we did. And so I was shocked when I walked in and opened the door, and there is Brett, the big angry dude. And I'm like, uh, man, are you lost? You know, is there like a Slayer concert nearby? Like, what's, what's happening right now? I remember he was like, hey, man. I was like, hey, what's going on? And then he said, hey, Eric invited me to this thing. He said, I didn't even know stuff like this existed. He said, and we've been sitting over in a corner, and he's been telling me all about Jesus and, and, and the love of God and what that's like. And, and I remember he looked at me, and he said, I'm just so glad I'm here. And it broke my heart because I realized I didn't even see him as worthy of this message I knew. And yet you see in the people who knew Jesus a clarity. I have a king, a confidence. I have a clarity and I am his and these people need this message so I am moving toward them. Do you see your world that way? Or do we just get too busy with our little stuff? 
Or do you see the people in your office or at your school as worthy of the message, worthy of the good news that you've found? Philip goes to Samaria, and he carries the name, and he begins to preach, and it says the crowd with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him, when they saw what he did for unclean spirits were crying out in a loud voice, coming out of people. The lame were being healed. There was much joy in that city. Philip's actions and Philip's words brought joy to the city, and that's my hope for us. We sing it, joy to the world. That can come through us the messengers of the king. And so Philip leads a revival in Samaria. He changes the culture because he saw himself as a carrier of the name. And so we hear this and some of you go, well, Ben, that's awesome perspective. That's how we're supposed to see it. I walk into work tomorrow as a carrier of the name of Jesus. But Ben, how am I supposed to do that? Some of you, it's the mechanics that scare you. You go, I want to talk about Jesus, but how do you do it in a way that's not weird? I'm supposed to walk in my office with my Bible and be like, hey, Bob, how's it going? Repent, right? And hit him with it like, is that what I do now? Well, no. So as we move down through the book, we're going to watch Philip zoom one-on-one and not go to leading a revival of thousands. We're going to watch Philip in a one-on-one conversation, and it's going to show us the technique of how he talked about Jesus in a way that wasn't super weird. And so we're going to skip past a moment where after he preaches the gospel, he gets in kind of in a standoff with a magician, which happens sometimes, but we got to move past that (laughs) because in verse 26, it says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And I love that the passage tells us that Philip has the boldness to share Jesus and he leads a revival of thousands in the city. And then God comes to him and says, hey, go down to the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. That's south. Samaria is north of Jerusalem. God tells him to go south, go through the city, go out and go to a road that's a desert place, literally the middle of nowhere. So God tells him, leave the familiarity, leave the success, leave everyone knowing you. There's Philip. Oh my gosh, that's him. Leave all that and go to the desert road. And Philip, this is what's so amazing in verse 27, it says, and he rose and he went. What's your first practical point to being a carrier of the name? Are you even willing to be used by God? I mean, God basically tells him, leave Houston and go down to like Harlingen. You know, you'd be like, what? Why? But he doesn't say why. He doesn't say, no God, I'm comfortable here. No God, I kind of get some area. He doesn't say that. God says go. And so he goes. And my question to us, our first practical point is, are you even willing to entertain the possibility that God may want to use you tomorrow? Is that something you're even willing to think about? And so Philip's on his way to go, and we're meant to do that too. I remember for me, when this dawned on me was in college. I remember one summer, uh, I worked at Lupe Tortillas. Uh, and it was back when there was only one. And uh, I remember going there, and yes, Lupe would make the fajitas. She's a wonderful little lady and made incredible fajitas. And, uh, but I would work there, and uh, it was brutal. I mean, you would work all day long. I lost 10 pounds from just sweating and carrying fajitas to people. And uh, it was a hard summer because you'd work all day long and be exhausted by the end of it, the way it was structured back then. And so it was brutal. And I remember for me, I got into this rhythm where I would pull up at work in the morning, park my car, and I would say a little prayer. And my prayer was, God, please help me get through today. And then I'd get out of the car, right? Until I remember one day about midsummer, I stopped in the car and realized, like my prayer, like it makes sense, but it's not like, like, there's a good shot I'm going to survive. You know what I mean? Like, nothing's going to go down at Lupe's that's going to, that's going to end this ride for me, right? And so I was sitting there, and I was like, Lord, and this is legit. I said this. I was like, Lord, just help me get through today. And if you want to use me or whatever, that's fine. <laughs> it was that inspirational. And... Uh, <laughs> So I remember I walked into work, and literally, I walk in, and I went in to wipe down the tables, because that's how you start the day, cleaning all the tables. And so I walk in, grab a rag, start wiping down the tables. First guy I see is one of the other waiters, turns the corner and goes, hey, Ben, yeah, you believe in God? I was like, yeah. And he goes, tell me what you believe about him. I was like, uh, okay. And so I just started talking to him about God and about Jesus, the Son of God, who came for us to rescue us, give us new life in Jesus. I started telling him this whole story, and he's like, hang on a second. He leaves. And he goes and gets this other guy. And they sit down and they're like, yeah, keep going, start over. I'm like, okay. 
And so I started telling about it. I'm like, why are we doing this? And it turns out the two of them had watched like a, a show on TV about, the fact, about aliens creating the world and it freaked them out. <laughs> and it started making them question what the heck's going on here. And so they walked in and just started asking me to tell them about God. So I sat down at this table and just for I don't know how long just began to talk to these guys about God. I remember it blew my mind. I just thought God didn't come into Lupe Tortillas or something. But I remember walking in there and I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. This, and I realized I didn't even do anything that amazing. Just said, God, I'm open. And I don't know about you, maybe you're bold. I had friends like this that, that just had a natural knack for talking about Jesus with people. I would go with a guy to bus stops. And I remember he'd walk up to people with a Bible and go, hey man, I was reading this passage today. He'd read it and go, what do you think about that? And I remember the guy was like, I think I needed to hear that today. He's like, I think you did too. And he would just have these moments. <laughs> and I'm like, how does he, I would walk in and be like, hey man, no, no, we're cool. We're cool, man. It's cool. All right, it's cool. And I was like, it just it didn't work for me. And I realized I'm not good at that. And so I just started to pray and I started to pray what I was praying. Lord, if you're willing, I'm open to being used by you today. So I used to walk into this Starbucks down the road here and I would do that. I'd walk into Starbucks and I'm like, I don't know how you talk about Jesus at Starbucks. They didn't weird, you know, like, thank you for the latte. Do you know the latte of King? No, okay, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I'm like, I don't, it's not working for me. So I remember I would sit and study when I was a youth pastor there. And every time I sat down to study, I would pray, Lord, I'm, I'm open if you want to use me in this place. I'm here every day and I'm not making a difference in Starbucks. And I'd like to if, if you're up for that. And I remember I would pray that day after day, and I'll never forget one time this lady went on break, took her apron off, walked over, sat right down at my table and said, you believe in God? Said, yeah, and she goes, okay, I need you to pray for my son. She said, I see you in here reading your Bible every day. I need you to pray for him. And she started telling me about what was going on with her kid. And I said, okay. So we prayed together right there, and I told her I commit to keep praying for your son. And I remember the next time I walked to that Starbucks, I walk up, take my order, and she's like, hey, y'all need to meet this guy. He's praying for my son. Come here, meet this guy. And she started introducing me to everyone that works at Starbucks. And so by the end, when I walked in there, I knew everybody there, and they started coming to Faith Bridge. And I looked at that, and I'm like, I don't even know how to start conversations. I honestly don't. It's a miracle I got married. And yet, <laughs> God will condescend to use us if we would even offer up a prayer of, Lord, I'm willing. Are you even willing to entertain the idea that he just might want to use you this Christmas to help people who dwell in deep darkness to understand that a light has dawned? Do you want that to be your story? I think you do. Would you pray with me? God, use me. And so God calls Philip go, and Philip goes. And it says, he rose and went, and it says, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. I love that. Philip is open to be used by God. And the way the passage reads, it says, there was an Ethiopian. Literally, it says, and behold, an Ethiopian. Philip's like, God, I'm ready to be used. Well, look at that, an Ethiopian. Why an Ethiopian? Well, Ethiopia was largely considered at that time as, quote, the ends of the earth, is what you see in ancient literature. Philip's about to touch the ends of the earth. He's about to break Africa open with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this isn't just an Ethiopian. He's a eunuch, which I'm not going to get into details about what a eunuch is. You can ask Ken later. <laughs> Basically means you're not having kids. Um, and it means... Uh, that in those days, when you would go to Jerusalem to worship, they told you, you're not allowed past a certain point. Uh, you don't get to come near to God. And yet it also says he's a court official, literally a powerful one under the queen. In Ethiopia, they had a king, but he was widely considered the son, uh, son of the son, and so too dignified to do administrative work. So the queen ran the country. And this guy was in charge of all her treasure, who Philip just ran across was the CFO of Ethiopia. Coming from Jerusalem, where he wanted to worship God because he's beginning to ask spiritual questions he doesn't know answers to, hitting limits, and so he's driving away, reading Isaiah, trying to understand, yeah, I got the money, yeah, I run a nation, but I'm empty inside. And there's a lot of people you know who are like that. They got it together out here, they do not in here, and they're beginning to realize they don't. And so Philip doesn't know any of this. Philip just rode, knows desert road, go, and he does. And when he arrives there, it says, the spirit said to Philip, go and join the chariot. And I love that. It doesn't unpack anymore. It doesn't say, 
go and join that chariot because there's an Ethiopian in there. I'm about to blow the gospel wide open to Africa. It's going to be cool, man. Get there. He doesn't tell him any of that. All Philip gets is, you should be near that guy. And so Philip has to, in the text, run up to the chariot and say, do you understand what you're reading? That's your second practical point. Number one is, are you willing to be used by God? And number two is, embrace the awkwardness. Because it is awkward to talk about spiritual things. It always is, because people seldom do. But Philip embraced the awkward. God said, go. Didn't give him any reason why. And so what did Philip have to do? Just ran up to a chariot. Hey, man. What's up? You reading something in there? What you reading? And he begins to talk to him. Was that weird? I would guess so. And let me just say this to you. Initiating spiritual conversations are always weird. Because some of you are like, Ben, it's going to be weird. And let me just say, yes, it is. Because people don't often talk about spiritual things, right? And it's weird even when God tees it up. I remember for me, when I first became a pastor, I was sitting on a plane one time, and I sat by a woman, and she started talking. She's like, hey, what do you do? I was like, oh, I'm a pastor. What are you doing? She was like, well, actually, I'm on this plane because I'm on my way to go bury my father. He just died, and I'm kind of torn up about it, and it's sort of uh, really difficult. And I'm like, oh, so sorry for your loss. Right? Put my earphones in. Got to do what I always do, get into my little introvert bubble on the plane. And it was maybe 20 minutes in that I'm like, her dad just died. She's emotionally distraught about it. And God puts her next to a pastor on the plane. Ben, do you think you should pray for her? And I thought, nah, that'll be weird. <laughs> and I was like, or it'll be weirder if you don't. And so I just did it. It was like, oh, good. I'm like, excuse me, miss. And just said, like, I'm a pastor. Can I pray for you? And, and it actually was super meaningful for her. And I was so glad I did it, but it's hard. And yet, I'm not the only one. It's not just pastors. Ephesians 2 says, God is good works. He's prepared for all of us that we would walk into them. So my full prayer that I pray, just so you can know it, is God, would you create opportunities for me to talk about you? And then would you give me the courage to take them? That's my prayer to God. And I challenge you to do that. God, will you create the opportunities? Because I can't. And would you give me the courage to enter into them? So not that long ago, I found out my grandfather was sick in the hospital in his 90s, and hospital plus 90s usually equals the end. So they were like, hey, your grandpa's in the hospital. It's not looking good. And as I was praying for him, I just felt like, Ben, you should go and talk to him about making peace with God. You should tell him about Jesus. And initially I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. He doesn't like to talk about spiritual things. He shoots those conversations down all the time. I'm not sure if he likes me all that much. <laughs> when we show up at the hospital, there's going to be a bunch of people there talking about everything else in the universe. There's not going to be a moment that'll make any sense. I don't want to do it. But I just kept thinking about what do you want to be true when he's gone? And what I want to be true is that I told him about life. So I got in the car, started driving to San Antonio. And the whole time I'm having this inner conflict. Of, I don't know why I'm doing this. It's not going to work. It's going to be super weird. I'm going to show up, get rejected, and come back by dinner. This is going to be great. And so I remember showing up there, and I turned the corner, and my grandpa is alone in his hospital room reading uh, a book about Duck Dynasty. <laughs> and it was the book by the dad, his biography, and he had just finished the chapter where the dad was talking about how he was an alcoholic and, and really, really um, destroying his life, ruining his marriage. And then someone told him about Jesus, and Jesus changed everything. And so my grandfather's alone in that room reading that book. And I walk in and say, what are you reading? And he tells me, and I said, what do you think about that? He said, it's a good book. It's a good book. It's a good. I'm like, well, yeah, but what do you think about that? about God changing someone's life like that because you're going to meet God pretty soon. What do you think about that? And that's your third point. Can I just tell you, is the point number three of practical ways to talk about spiritual things is lead with a question. Lead with a question. What are you reading? What do you think about that? When someone tells you about a rough situation, you say, where is God in that for you? I mean, lead with a question. Notice that's what Philip does. Philip runs up next to the chariot and says, what are you reading? He doesn't run up with a sermon. He doesn't run up and say, Oof. it's like Africa hot down here, isn't it? You know what else is hot? Hellfire. He doesn't do it. <laughs> he is genuinely interested. And Donna and I, whenever we go to a meeting, we did it last night, we do it every day. Whenever we go 
to meet with somebody, have dinner with anybody, whatever, we always stop in the car, we hold hands, and we pray, and we pray for God to be exalted in the conversation, and we pray, Lord, let us be genuinely interested in them. Because we know God is, and we want to be. And the way to show someone you're genuinely interested in them is to ask them questions. Because when you ask people questions, people get to talk about themselves. And when they talk about themselves, you will see it play out. The glory of God in their life and the deep brokenness of the world in their life because that's every human story. And often the conversation leads to the gospel even when you don't even know. And so I remember for me when I first became a youth pastor here, I was right out of college, came here as a youth pastor, and I got into these moments where for me, my way to communicate was sarcasm. Walk into a conversation, listen to how people talk, try to find a way to say something funny, and if it's at the expense of somebody else, whatever, as long as it makes you look good. That was, that was the currency of college, was sarcasm, right? And then I showed up here, and junior high kids is like fish in a barrel, man. It's just too easy. They're saying the goofiest stuff, and so I'm just making fun of kids left and right. I'm like, you guys are ridiculous, right? <laughs> and I realized over time, junior high kids don't understand sarcasm. Uh, so it wasn't as funny to them. And, but what they did understand is it felt like the pastor guy's making fun of me. So I'm not going to talk anymore. And I realized I was shutting down conversations rather than opening them up by just thinking about what I'm going to say next. And God broke my heart about that. And I realized when I walk into conversations, when I walk into the church, I'm going to be looking for ways to ask questions, to move deeper, to be genuinely interested in people, because I believe when that happens, the gospel will open up. And I remember when God really laid that on my heart, the first time I walked into the church, I walked up to a kid that was sitting alone, because that's what I would do, and I remember walking up to him, and I asked him, what are you into? Because that was always my lead question, like, hey, man, what are you into? What do you do? And I remember asking him, what are you into? And he was like, well, I love the oboe. I was like, Okay. <laughs> And for me, it was like so many jokes rising, just, ooh, they're all fighting to get out. It's like, no, stay inside, right? <laughs> and I just pressed further with a question. I was like, how does that happen? Like, how do you get into the oboe? Because like no one in my family is musical. So I don't even know, were you just driving along in life? And was like, oboe, pull over. All right, I mean like, how does that happen? And he said, well, my dad was musical. I was like, oh, that's cool, man. Did your dad teach you how to play? And he said, no, my dad's gone. And instantly, we're into his pain. And we got to have a deep conversation about where he is in life. And I remember in that moment just being so glad that I, I could find within me interest about the oboe. Because why? Because it became interest about this person. And all of a sudden, we're touching eternity in our conversation. And so as a carrier of a name, the ambassador of the king to people who we can have compassion for, worthy of the message, when we come in being willing to be used by God, being courageous enough to let God use us, and you lead with a question and being genuinely interested with someone, look what happens to Philip. He asked the Ethiopian, do you understand what he's reading? And he says, how can I? He's trying to investigate spiritual things, and he doesn't get it. And so he's reading the Old Testament about like a sheep led to a slaughter. There was a man who was silent. He didn't open his mouth, but his life was taken away. And the Ethiopian says, who is this talking about? And it says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with that scripture, told him the good news about Jesus. And that's my prayer this morning as we enter into Christmas time, that we would be willing to be used by God praying to be used by God, have eyes to see how we could be used by God. And then when the Lord opens up conversational doors, we do what Philip did, speak about God. That there's a world out there that's searching for answers in all manner of vacant things, and we know him. And might we be carriers of his name into our offices, into our place of work, into our schools of inviting people, of saying, why don't you come hang out with my friends? Why don't you come to dinner with a group of us? Hey, why don't you just come to this service with me? I know you don't do that sort of thing. Come to this one. You'll be fine. You'll survive it, and then we'll go wherever you want. And we'll do that sort of thing and begin to move with people as you engage them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you something. When you begin to do that, that's when you'll feel most alive. That she goes, where this whole world is going is the announcing of this king, and I'm a carrier of his name. When you live a life on mission like that, I promise that's where life gets fun, and I want that for you. Let me pray for it. Lord, I want to thank you that the good news of Christmas is not Jesus is here, so we need to act better. The good news of Christmas is we are broken because of sin, 
We're a mess. None of us, none of us are who we should be. And yet Jesus Christ came not to give us a lecture, but to give us life. That when we cling to him, when we say, I need you to forgive me, to love me, to adopt me, he does. And so, Lord, if there's anybody here today who just thought religion was be a good person, I pray you would change that. Even now that they would say, that's not what it is. It's a relationship with God through what Jesus Christ has done. That he came for us, that we might live through him. And if you've got questions about that, man, please come to uh, the Welcome Center outside and talk with some of the pastors here. Talk to us about what God's doing in your heart. Let this Christmas be the time you embrace the Christ, the King. And God, for those of us who know you, I think there's fear maybe in some of us even now of going, I do want to talk about Jesus, but that scares me to death. And I just want to challenge you even now to pray and say, Lord, let me be willing to be used by you. Lord, will you create opportunities and give me the courage to step into them? Lord, I pray the great gift we give our friends and others is a chance to hear about the King we love so dearly. Be glorified, our King, in this, your birthday. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart, who just talked about eternal impact made through everyday people. Welcome, Ben. Thanks. Good to have you back. Thank you. And so the message today just looked at Acts, Acts 8, and we talked about um, spreading the gospel and our responsibility as everyday people um, to share Jesus with people that we know. And you told so many great stories of um, the full range of emotions it can bring from awkwardness at Mm -hmm. times (laughs) to just seeing God show up in such an amazing way. Um, Ken talked about uh, before the sermon, just as we move into 2017 as FaithBridge, um, we're going to take a more practical look at discipleship and a lot of things including uh, giving, but also including sharing the gospel and evangelism. Yeah. Um, if you were to tell me who was just trying to get started with sharing the gospel, I feel it today. Like, I know I'm called to do this. Yeah. I want to tell people about what Jesus is in my life, but I feel like yeah. I don't know where to start. What, right. what would you, how could you help me? Yeah. You know, for me, it was um, just in my experience, putting a lot of pressure on myself of I have to get him from zero to through a systematic theology conversation in conversation one usually made everything weird for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I took the pressure off myself in that sense, but put it on in the other sense of going, Lord, I want to be used by you today. And and may I be open to that. And Lord, help me see people, care about people. So I would say to start there, just as you're walking into your Mm -hmm everyday life, begin to pray for that. And then what happens is you tend to take a genuine interest in other human beings. When you say, hey, how are things going? They're like, oh, it's a rough weekend. You don't go, sorry to hear it, man. And then leave, you go, oh man, I'm sorry, what happened? And you begin to press in. And it's like a doctor who asks diagnostic questions. It's the more he asks, the more accurately you can see where you're hurting and apply the balm there, you know? So to me, getting to know people, asking them questions helps me know how to speak to them directly. And then there's very natural ways to get into it of, of when someone's sharing with you your life, you can say, hey, I'm gonna pray for that for you. And, uh, you know, and, and I think for some people, you can even ask them what, you know, as if it's just normal conversation, what's your spiritual background, things like that, getting to know people. But there will come a point where if you're living that kind of life, people are gonna ask you what's going on with you. Mm-hmm. They always do. And at that point, you don't want to take the position where you go, we're just really sweet people. I see so many Christians do that, and they just sort of say, oh, we're just really nice guys. Rather than missing that opportunity, I think of sharing the truth through your life. So I take a genuine interest in you, and then when you give me an opportunity to speak, I'm going to speak the truth, but through my life. Um, So an example, my sister and her friend uh, met a group of guys once in Europe, and... The guys found out they were Christians. 
And one of them's like, I don't even know how you can believe that. I just don't know how you can believe that. Christians have done this and this, and the Crusades, and the political, and the political climate, and this election. You're trying to take freedom. And it just, he, he got himself all riled up. And my sister said it was amazing to watch my friend hear all that, and she didn't get baited into any of it, didn't condescend into any of it. But when he was done, she just said, I, I don't have anything to say about any of that, and I don't know what your experience has been. I just know for me, when I look at the man, Jesus Christ, there's nobody else like him. And the more I've come to know him and trust him, he's changing my life. And Mandy said the tone changed. Because mm -hmm. he's not going to say to that, well, you're an idiot. You know, mm -hmm. like there's not really like, there's nowhere to hit your sword against them at that point. And Mandy said, you know, over the course of that conversation, he began to say towards the end, I wish I had what you have. I want what you have. Total tone shift because it was sharing your story. Mm -hmm. This is how God has impacted my life. So even if you go, I don't know if I have confidence to explain to them the Bible and its nuances. I don't know how to answer these questions. Don't answer them. Just say what you know. Mm -hmm. Say, I know God and I know he's changed my life and I really would like you to know Jesus like I do. No one's going to say, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. They, they usually, it de-escalates. Now behind that, I would say, get to know what you believe. And, you know, here you can join a community group, get some training on what are the basic essential aspects of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Jesus really lived a perfect life. He really died. That death accomplished something. It paid the penalty, the debt of our sin. Faith in him, we have life. Learn a couple Bible verses. We encouraged our, we would give kind of a resource to our team leaders at Breakaway that gave them about six Bible verses to memorize. Just start with John 3.16 and mm -hmm. teach that. So I wouldn't overthink it, um, but be open to talking about God and you'll see the conversation move. Be open to talk about Jesus. Learn what you believe in a community and small groups and uh, be courageous. It's good. I don't know. Does that help? It's, it's Ramble, very, oh, it's very helpful. It. And I yeah. think, um, if anything, come to us at FaithBridge and connect to community. Absolutely. Go through the starting point class, yeah. uh, the different things that we have here. Um, I know one thing that's great about my grow group is we're always praying for each other for opportunities with particular people in their lives. But it's also good when you come back and you either hear a story where God was, or you hear someone say, it didn't go good. Can you guys <laughs> pray for me yeah. and help me figure out what the next step is? Like, don't try to go all of this alone Yeah, and have absolutely. support and community. And for me, what I would often tell people, which is what I do, is like we were praying for an opportunity to meet our neighbors. And at Thanksgiving, my neighbor ran across the street to meet me because I was frying a turkey. And I didn't go, here's the chance. I got to get through the fact that Jesus was the ontological <laughs> second person of the Trinity and that he really, his death was substitutionary atonement. I was like, I can't do that. Uh, he knows I'm a pastor, mm -hmm. but all my friends are in my house. I'm going to have him meet my people. Mm -hmm. And he's going to see people who love Jesus are wonderful people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my people get it. So they, we all sat around, talked with him. He's going on and on about his family. And we just got to know him. And it was awesome. And it was like, you know what? We weren't trying to get all the way there in this conversation of what do you think about Jesus? I'd love to talk to him about that. But um, I just let him inviting him into our social sphere. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's the mm -hmm. great first start. Yeah. Let him meet some nice Jesus people. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, I love how you talked about the angels being the messengers of mm -hmm. Christmas and of the message. And now we are that to the world. Yeah. Um, and such a great message. Um, so thank you and thanks that. for being back here with us. And thank you for being here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.